Wherever he goes, the scenes are often the same. Opposition leader Huang Guaido has become a national hero of sorts. But up until a month ago, very few people in Venezuela actually knew his name. Since January 23rd, when he invoked a constitutional provision to declare himself interim president, I swear, he's been catapulted to stardom. And he plans to start by changing the government. Welcome, Mr. President. They really like you here. It's an opportunity for Venezuela. What they like is the opportunity to change the country, and that's our idea to change the entire country. For the past three weeks, Juan Guaido has embodied a renewed attempt by the Venezuelan opposition to remove Nicolas Maduro from power. But can the 35-year-old former student leader really do that? I got a chance to meet Juan Guaido after one of his rallies in Caracas to talk about Venezuela's uncertain future and his jolting present. Mr. President, Hola, hi. very how nice to meet you. Very well. How are you doing? Nice. That was very energetic. That was very impressive. Very, very inspirational. Inspirational, Con, absolutely. Conmovedor. Conmovedor, sí. sí. Um, you, are you used to this now? Because uh, you, <laughs> no. you used to be a student leader, a politician, but this is brand new. Yes, this is all brand new, but for me it reflects the moment Venezuela is living in. A very critical, painful moment for all, but with a desire to win. This is a country that wants to believe in itself, and this is the proof that we can push forward. Mr. President, thank you very much for speaking to us here on your news. Nicolas Maduro told me that your political campaign, your political movement, which he describes as a coup d'etat against him, is over, has failed. What do you say to that? Well, Venezuela has spent years building a majority, a movement to mobilize towards unity. Today, 90% of the country wants to get out of this crisis, a crisis generated by someone who today usurps the function of Mia Flores, a humanitarian crisis generated without president. 3,300,000 Venezuelans, that's 15% of the population, has been forced to migrate. Venezuelan GDP has contracted by 53 points. 2 million percent inflation last year. It's difficult for a civilian leader to carry out a coup d'etat. That's what the military does. If it were a coup d'etat, why am I still free? Giving interviews, generating mobilizations, authorizing the entry of humanitarian aid, naming ambassadors in the world. I don't know. When we see big mobilizations like the one on February the 12th in Venezuela, they're without precedent. 60 places across the country. We see a group of volunteers getting organized for peaceful humanitarian aid. It seems today, in an alarming way, Maduro is completely disconnected from reality in Venezuela. This crisis, this political standoff, this situation where Venezuela has two presidents, um, is dragging on for longer than many observers had expected. Are you concerned that your movement could lose steam, could lose momentum? Sí, Venezuela tiene eh, un presidente legítimo encargado. Venezuela has a legitimate president in charge. Unfortunately, there was an election in 2018 that brought this to the crossroads. Article 233 of our constitution empowers me to assume the president in charge of elections in Venezuela. Cada vez más aislado. Cada vez 
For example, Luisa Ortega Diaz, who was prosecutor appointed by Chavez, is now in exile. He's keeping Torres in prison. Every day, pictures of him are torn down. So the success of our movement is guaranteed. Our support base is growing, as seen through international aid. Trade union groups, trade union centers, unions, young people, students, volunteers. So the future for Venezuela is guaranteed. We have to deal with this hard present situation where people are dying of hunger, where those who are in the regime today deny an unprecedented humanitarian emergency, at least in this part of the world. So the good news is that the future today is guaranteed for Venezuela and that Maduro is becoming more and more isolated as time goes on. You talk about a movement that is growing, a movement that is getting more and more support. But this support will mean nothing if you don't have the armed forces on your side. Are you negotiating with the Venezuelan army right now? We are talking to all public workers, civilians, soldiers who are willing to pursue three objectives that will give us a step towards a better Venezuela, an end to usurpation, a transitional government and free elections. Of course, we are talking to public workers at all levels. I insist civilians and also non-civilians as well. What has the army been telling you? Well, you've seen it. 27 sergeants expressed dissatisfaction in Cotiza three weeks ago. Today, they are being tortured in the military counterintelligence directorate. A general of the Air Force expressed support for our taking charge of the presidency. Every day, we receive messages and calls, but there is a sector that's being particularly persecuted, tortured, which is the armed forces. Today, in Venezuela, are the 350 political prisoners. 160 military prisoners tortured, persecuted, and their families. Venezuela today still lives under a dictatorship. That is the important thing that the world also knows at this moment. So speaking to the armed forces is key to produce a peaceful transition. That is what I believe Venezuelans want. What is your short-term plan? What is your next move? The priority is to let humanitarian aid into the country on February the 23rd. It'll help us to contain the emergency. With this, we are also testing the armed forces to see whose side they're on. Are they on the side of the citizen, the constitution, or someone who is usurping the functions and even keeps professional troops of the armed forces and middle managers hungry? They can't live on their salary. Today, the minimum the minimum salary of the Venezuelan is $6 per month, so nobody can live with $6 a month, they can barely survive. So I don't think that a military man, a civilian, a nurse or someone who belongs to the transport union likes this situation. It's very tense. The republic, the state bureaucracy, every day makes reconstruction more expensive. Reconstruction of the oil industry, the process of assembling or reassembling the rule of law. But as I said in the rally, the battleground is chosen by the oppressor and we have put a lot of sacrifice into years of struggle in this construction of majority, of electoral majority, of majority exercised in the streets, and we're going to do everything possible to get out of this dictatorship. You just talked about the minimum salary here in Venezuela. Um, throughout your speeches, you seem to quote a lot of this crisis, and you say you understand this crisis, you've been experiencing it. A lot of people say that the authorities here in Venezuela are out of touch. So I asked Nicolas Maduro how, what he thought 2,000 Bolivars could buy. He was unable or unwilling to give me an answer. Do you know what 2,000 Bolivars can buy today? You can buy, for example, a cup of coffee in Venezuela. You can buy a kilo of queso. You can buy 
You can't buy, for example, a coffee with milk, but in Venezuela you can't buy a kilo of cheese, that's if you can find it, because sometimes you can't even do that. You can't buy a box of antibiotics, you can't buy one dollar. With 2,000 bolivars, you can't even buy a dollar. So you can imagine what you can buy in Spain or France. Here it's even worse because our economy was dollarized. With inflation running at 2 million percent, people tried to protect their salary and merchants or entrepreneurs began to match costs with the dollar. So what I buy with 2,000 bolivars in Venezuela, I can't even buy a coffee with milk, a small coffee with milk. That is part of the fabric of Venezuelan culture, to drink an early morning coffee or to share it with somebody. But now you can't do that in Venezuela, even though it's part of our culture. The situation is very difficult. Uh, some say it's never been this bad. Um, but some of your allies have been talking about supporting you all the way through and all options are on the table, even a military intervention. There could be a bloodbath, a massacre. Would you still support that? In Venezuela, today there is a bath of blood. In Venezuela today, there's already a bloodbath. Caracas, where we're having this conversation, is the most violent capital in the world. The second most violent is Valencia, two hours from here, and the fifth most violent is Puerto Ordaz, which is five hours away. We're already in a bloodbath. Today, in Venezuela, there's a bloodbath because it's the most violent country in the world. The FAES, which is a special unit of the police, and the armed forces, assassinates in cold blood, searches the protesters' homes and kills them. 70 in just one week. There were 150 people murdered in the protests of 2017. So it's controversial to talk about that. I understand that they say it's because this could lead to a supposed civil war. Entiendo que lo dicen porque esto pudiera llegar a una supuesta guerra civil. En Venezuela no hay posibilidad de una guerra civil. But there won't be a civil war in Venezuela, because nobody will take any risks for Maduro. Nobody's ready to take any risks for someone who has no political future, who's not recognized by the world, who doesn't even have the respect of his subordinates. Someone that broke the chain of power when he was not elected to a position that does not correspond to him. So this option, military intervention, scares Maduro, which is why he keeps organizing military exercises and appearing with troops, while we get together with volunteers peacefully, wearing white. So there's no possibility, I believe, of a civil war in Venezuela, because we're already living one, and nobody will take risks for someone who has no ideological principles and who's looking to save himself and not his citizens. When they say there is a country who wants to intervene and take all the resources of Venezuela, then that is just complete ignorance. It is our main historical client, the United States. Even Chavez and Maduro were selling to our main client, which is the United States. The second is India. We are already selling to the United States. Maduro is doing this himself. Your main client and also one of your main allies right now, the US President Donald Trump has called you. Uh, what did he have to say? President Trump did call me, but also President Duque and a few minutes ago Sebastian Pinera. I also spoke with the President of France. Part of what I spoke with Trump about is support for democracy. Venezuelans are dignified and behaving in a sovereign manner. In the three weeks that I've been doing this job, we have already had the support of almost 60 countries, which gives a country like Venezuela great opportunities and great resources. It gives us the capacity to hopefully recover our economy soon. How important has this international support been 
Sí. No, es fundamental, fundamental como la, la movilización de, de nuestra gente. Vivimos It's been en, essential, en global, essential, just like the mobilization of our people. We live now in a global world. Our first oil client is the US, then India, then Russia, and China, with who we have several deals. So these relationships are important for the future of my country and indeed any country. To have the support and to have the trust that we have now gathered. A few days ago, we got 110 million dollars worth of support from 30 countries for humanitarian help for Venezuela. This is something the regime is unable to do because it lacks something essential in any society, which is trust. That's absolutely fundamental in our society. Nicolas Maduro still has some important friends abroad. I'm talking about China, Russia, Did you reach out to them as well? And what did they have to say? Sí, queremos hablar con con todos. We want to talk to everyone. Russia and China have important investments in the Venezuelan oil industry and also some construction plans that the government of China executed through their development bank. Almost 90% of this construction is paralyzed. Trains, factories, sugar factories, amongst other things. We're talking about 60 millions paralyzed. Venezuela went from producing 3.5 million barrels of oil a day to only one. 1 million barrels of oil a day. So pragmatically, logically, economically, financially, is it good for Russia that a country that is a business partner goes from 3 million barrels a day to only 1 million barrels? I believe the answer is obvious. Is it good for China that 90% of what it invested in in construction work in Venezuela is now paralyzed? Again, the answer is obvious. Just like it's obvious for Venezuelans that with Maduro one doesn't eat, there's no democracy, there won't be trust, there won't be loans to restart the economy. But did these leaders pick up the phone? Did you manage to get someone to talk to you about possibly changing their opinion about Maduro? We're making sure they get the message. Nicolas Maduro is under a lot of pressure, unprecedented international pressure. But it's, it seems at least quite difficult to be in your shoes as well. I mean, the Supreme Court here in Venezuela has um, imposed a travel ban, financial restrictions, they've blocked your bank accounts. You talk about members of your family being um, under a lot of pressure, being intimidated. Are you worried about what could happen to you? Are you worried about what could happen to your family? In Venezuela, exercising politics or opposition, it can cost you your life. This happened to Fernando Alban, who was murdered by Sebin. He's a Caracas politician. It can cost you also your freedom, like Leopoldo Lopez, who's been in prison for more than five years, or Juan Recozen, a politician who's been kidnapped. It can cause you to be exiled, like Carlos Vecchio, José Manuel Oliveras, Gabi Arellano, amongst others. It can cost you asylum, like Freddy Guevara. Of course, there is a risk if you were a politician in Venezuela. The judicial persecution that they make against me also happens to the unions. Ruben Gonzalez, principal trade unionist of basic industries in Venezuela, he's in jail. This is very funny because we're supposed to have a leftist regime or government and they imprison union leaders. It's a very deep contradiction of this regime. Now, I'm not worried about this costing me my life or my freedom. If I give my life to serve the people, we know the risks we face. Our biggest fear is what's happening in Venezuela becomes normal. To go to a hospital where children are dying of malnutrition or dehydration, to a hospital where you can't get antibiotics. Today, hospitals don't have them. There are also more serious cases. For example, as happened to an activist friend of ours who had a bullet in his thigh. He lost his leg because there was no alcohol in the hospital. That's a concern that our children grow up with the dream of leaving their country and emigrate because they do not find opportunities in the country where they were born. It has nothing to do with jail, and that's why we have not stopped, even though we've been threatened by them. I want to talk to you about oil, virtually the only source of hard currency for Venezuela. 
You have just named a new board of directors for PDVSA and Citgo. How exactly is this going to work? Because these are companies that already have board of directors. This, this announcement has legal and financial implications. Sobre todo legales. Inicialmente la nombramos una junta ad hoc de PDVSA, que es la dueña. Well, above all legal implications. Initially, we named an ad hoc board of PDVSA. That is the owner of Citgo Holding Corporation. We appointed these boards of directors to be able to take control of the assets. When we recognize ourselves as the president in charge, we have to perform as our job demands. And having a Venezuelan and American jurisdiction, we are in the process of taking control of the board. Citgo is a refinery in the United States that refines extra heavy oil, which is what Venezuela has. That is why this was a strategic business for our country for years. And that's why, amongst other things, the United States is the main client for our oil. The extra heavy oil must be sold to refineries that can process it to have a finished product. That happens mainly in the United States, China and India. In the next few days, we will take control of Citgo and will continue to operate normally because, due to the reduction in oil production in Venezuela, where we have gone from 3.5 million to 1 million barrels a day, we are only sending 100,000 barrels of the 700,000 that the refinery can process. It will be a very quiet transition. We'll do the same once we can take control of PDVSA that has been destroyed in Venezuela. PDVSA became the third largest oil industry in the world. Today it's absolutely indebted, broken and dismantled due to very bad management. When you call for elections, and you've been talking a lot about the importance of free elections here in this country, when you call for elections, are you going to run for it? Are you intending, do you hope to be to go from interim president to just president of Venezuela? My role at this moment is to coordinate all sectors to lead and coordinate a very complex and unprecedented process. We are facing a dictatorship. So that process of who's going to be our candidate, because we're going to have only one candidate in all our sectors. We must leave it for when the usurpation ceases and we bring together all sectors. To speak at this moment of a candidacy would separate us, and that is not what any Venezuelans want right now. We're facing political assassination, a dramatic social crisis. What is next for Venezuela? Happiness, hope, recovering our industry so we can create jobs and become, once again, the country that we have always been. A country with open arms. We are the country with the second largest community of Italians. We have Spaniards, Colombians living here. We have always been a country that received many people because they used to be opportunity. Because we have a privileged climate, mineral reserves, basic industries, What's our future? A future with plenty of opportunities. Once we re-establish the rule of law, judicial security, so that we attract investment from the world to Venezuela, which will once again be a free country. Mr. President, thank you very much for coming to us. Thank you. Muchas gracias.